down. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So a uh, political uh, junkie, uh, a former uh, campaign manager, staffer, columnist, uh, uh, public policy, government relations, smart guy that I follow, uh, Warren Kinsella, wrote an article this past weekend in, uh, in the Toronto Sun um, that uh, I found really quite interesting. And uh, I wanted to uh, bring him on the show tonight to talk about it. Uh, it's uh, about protesters changed Canada but not in the ways they expected or wanted. The Ottawa occupation and the border blockades have irrevocably changed Canadians. Warren Kinsella, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So you're the, uh, the head of DAISY Group, which is a public affairs, government affairs uh, a company, I understand. Um, you've yeah. been involved in uh, politics for a long period of time. And you wrote uh, this column based on, a, uh, I guess, what you had seen going on, but also based on some polling that came out this weekend that you think... That's- um, showed that Canadians didn't support what was going on in Ottawa. Tell me a little bit about what you said in the column, please. So it was a gut impression I had, and then I consulted with my friend John Wright, who um, you undoubtedly know, who is the head of Maru polling in Canada. And John's been doing this stuff for more than three decades. And he came up with some results for the media organization I write for, Post Media, that indicated um that the vast majority of Canadians were against the uh, protests in Ottawa. They were initially sympathetic. And then just as the days went by, the truckers, the anti-vaxxers or whoever the heck they were, were losing people. But what I found not just surprising, but actually shocking in the research is what it had to say about what Canadians wanted done. So a significant number, in some cases, a majority, were quite prepared to use violence. They favored the use of violence, force, or worse, whatever or worse is, your guess is as good as mine, to rid Ottawa of the occupying protesters. So I spoke to John Wright about that. And I said, look, I've never seen anything like this before. You know, as you know, Brian, our, our reputation internationally is, you know, if, if somebody steps on our foot, we apologize to them. And, uh, you know, we're the conciliatory apologetic Canadians. And this research suggested a change in kind of the zeitgeist. And John confirmed it. And actually in a subsequent poll, he's confirmed it. Canadians over the past few weeks Um, have gotten really, really angry. And the fulcrum for that were the protests in Ottawa. And, um, you know, the column I wrote suggests that we're a bit more like the Americans now than we might think. Like the Americans in that we're polarized? Polarized, divided, however you want to express it. I mean, since I worked for full disclosure, I worked for Hillary Clinton and I worked for Joe Biden as a volunteer on both their presidential campaigns. And, you know, I started to see it. I worked for Hillary in three different states, including at her Brooklyn headquarters. And we were starting to see it then, this divide in American politics, which now uh, with Biden, uh, happily as president, has reached the point where the Republican Party is expressing support, some of them at least, for Vladimir Putin's side (laughs) in the Ukrainian uh, conflict. So, you know, the divide there is expressed in January 6th and the Tea Party and Occupy and all these different things that have happened in the U.S. We're starting now to see that uh, in Canada. I think a lot of us have thought we were exempt from it, but apparently not. But what you said in your column was that that the convoy and the protest and the occupation changed Canadians. So are you saying that not only did it... uh, did it uh, polarize the uh, the protesters, but it polarized the rest of Canada as well? That's what the research showed, is that this willingness to accept violence, like that is an unprecedented result. You know, I've been involved in this business for, for many years, as you pointed out at the outset. And um, I've never seen a result like that before, where Canadians had expressed a willingness to embrace violence to advance their political point of view. I don't recall the polling around the time of the application of the War Measures Act in 1970. Um, I I don't think in the the Oka crisis, we saw something similar. We've seen expressions of anger, but this shift in public opinion over the three plus weeks that the, the truckers were occupying Ottawa, it was a profound change. The big question is, does it last or is it something that will fade away? Well, I don't know the exact numbers, but what ended up happening during the FLQ crisis when the War Measures Act was uh, brought in is initially Canadians were incredibly supportive of uh, of then uh, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Um, it took a couple of years 
for people to uh, to turn against it, uh, and they didn't turn dramatically, uh, but uh, they started questioning the uh, the um, you know taking away charter rights and things like that, uh, um, fundamental rights, such that uh, the conservatives brought in the uh, the future emergency uh, measures act uh, that showed that you could never completely override the the charter rights. So initially, Canadians were extremely supportive, and I think it's typified by the you know the the pride that some people had in the just not the Justin Trudeau the Pierre Trudeau just watch me uh, uh, response to the questioner that uh, so many people quote over and over and over again. Yeah. And, you know, when I spoke to John Wright about it, I said, you know, John, what is going on here? Because this blows me away, this willingness to accept the use of violence or worse. And he said, um, you know, they drilled down into it. And really what Canadians experienced in the case of auto, the Ottawa occupation and perhaps, you know, the FLQ crisis, as you just expressed, is a loss of control where they, they, they saw with their own eyes the democratic institutions, whether it's the political people, whether it's the police, the courts, the justice system, were paralyzed, were ineffective. You know, we're not doing the job that they are paid to do. And it created this sense of anxiety and in, in this case, anger towards those institutions, as well as the people who are causing the trouble. So, you know, as I say, the, the thing I'm going to be watching for is, uh, as a columnist is, does this sentiment persist? Or as you pointed out, you know, in the case of the War Measures Act, it, it diminishes over time. Do you think this desire for... And and worse was that people wanted, frankly, the army to be called in to uh, to get rid of the occupiers. Yep. Yep. I mean, what else could it mean if you've accepted that violence is an appropriate response or worse? I mean, that sounded to me almost like they were prepared to let some of the protesters catch a bullet and uh, which obviously would be uh, completely, you know, unacceptable. I mean, the thing at the end of the day, you know, the New York Times actually, I'm glad we're doing this visually. I don't know if you can see this. You know, the New York Times on Sunday, which is their biggest edition, had a headline that says, police in Ottawa arrest truckers at gunpoint as they clear downtown. You know, this is supposed to be the best newspaper in the world. That's false. Got it wrong. No protesters were arrested at gunpoint. The police carried guns, right, as police tend to do just about everywhere. But nobody was arrested at gunpoint. It did not. Certainly there were angry truckers. Uh, and protesters, there were protesters who conducted themselves deplorably, and, you know, 191 of them were charged um, or arrested. Um, but, you know, this notion that people needed to be arrested at gunpoint, that was false. That did not happen. Actually, I think you know, like, like you probably, I spent the weekend watching uh, uh, the news coverage of what was going on in Ottawa um, glued to the TV set. And I was really quite proud. Uh, of the restraint that the police forces uh, used. And, you know, I almost had a sense of of renewed pride in my country to see Durham police, York police, uh, Toronto police, Vancouver police um, standing uh, side by side with the RCMP and the Ottawa police. And I got to tell you, and this is going to sound pretty strange, but I think the most difficult maneuver um, of the whole weekend um, was was actually performed by Sûreté de Québec uh, when they came in and single file went along the the southern fence of Parliament Hill at uh, Wellington and Bank, and then moved the whole crowd out of uh, that intersection. And I felt proud that it was the Sûreté de Québec that came into Ottawa, into Ontario, and made that maneuver side by side with all of those other police forces. I, I don't think that's strange at all. I agree with everything you just said. I felt exactly the same way. Police forces from Vancouver to Quebec City coming together to execute a very difficult operation. I used to be a cop reporter for years. I actually worked physically in the Ottawa police headquarters, the Ottawa citizen. We had an office there, and I know a lot of these guys. They executed this um, uh, action over the weekend with, as you say, professionalism and ex extraordinary restraint. They were being spat at, they were being cursed, they were being pushed back. I think they showed a tremendous amount of restraint. We owe them a debt of gratitude. We're chatting today with Warren Kinsella, the head of Daisy Group, a columnist for Post Media. 
who wrote a really interesting article on uh, Sunday in the in the in the Toronto. I read it in the Toronto Sun. Uh, I presume it was published uh, uh, more widely, but it was really interesting. It was quoting uh, some polling that came out over the weekend that uh, suggested that uh, a very strong majority of Canadians uh, were against what was going on in Ottawa, which I think uh, probably those uh, those protesters um, would be pretty shocked by. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Warren Cancel in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. It's a real, uh, it's a real pleasure, frankly, of mine to uh, to uh, to chat today with Warren Kinsella, head of Daisy Group, a columnist with uh, Post Media, a long-term uh, political activist, someone that uh, I've uh, looked up to uh, and uh, and followed uh, over the years. I'm not sure if you remember Warren, but you used to invite me to some great parties that you had at Daisy Group that were really quite fun <laughs> uh, on your rooftop uh, just off of uh, Blur Street. Was yeah, uh, I guess it was. Good times, I guess. Hopefully we'll come back to those at some point in time. Your um, comments, the, the, the statistics you quote in your column are really quite interesting. Let me uh, read a couple of them, uh, if uh, you could, and, and if I could, and, and what you describe it. It's a portrait of a country that has dramatically changed in the space of just three weeks. Here's a sampling. Nearly 70% of Canadians support Trudeau invoking the Emergencies Act. 82% said there is no way the Ottawa occupation should have gone on this long. A majority, 54%, say they are now ashamed to be a Canadian because of the politicians who allowed the situation to get out of hand. Many more than that, 71%, say that we are an international embarrassment because of the convoy truckers' occupation. Nearly 70% of all Canadians feel that any politicians who supported the occupation, Tory federal interim leader Candace Bergen and leadership frontrunner Pierre Polyev take note, should be voted out of office. Similarly, almost 60% said that any provincial premier who lowered COVID restrictions caved to those who effectively held Ottawa hostage for three weeks. I found those really interesting. And Warren, you know, you're a, a reader of, uh, of polls and public opinion and, and how it influences politics. With these kinds of numbers, why did the Conservatives en masse vote against the, uh, the imposition of the Emergency Measures Act? Why? Is Polyev and Candace Bergen so supportive of uh, of the truckers still, even after this poll comes out, and they must be hearing this from uh, from across uh, across Canada from their, their their people? And and why have so many premiers dropped COVID restrictions, even when people are saying that they're caving? Like, do these Tory politicians just not listen to the polls, listen to the people, or are they catering to this far right fringe minority? Well, I think uh, you and I have been around political campaigns for a long time, and we both know when a candidate stays in the campaign office, they're wasting time because they've got the votes of everybody who's in the campaign office. you got to go outside and knock on doors of people you don't have yet. And that, to me, was the essential problem of Candace Berg and Pierre Polyev and others embracing this group. You know, as angry as the truckers and the, these protesters were, they're not going to vote for Justin Trudeau. We know that. They're not going to vote for Jugmeet Singh. So Candace Bergen and the others, they've already got these votes. What they needed to do is show the country an ability to reach out to, to other voters. And they're consistently not doing that. They're preaching to their own converted, to use that cliche. That is the biggest political problem they've got, along with the fact, as you just pointed out, that a lot of people are mad at them for even just expressing support for the truckers, let alone doing what Polyev and Bergen did, which is go out and um, you know take selfies with them and give them coffee and food Sit and so on. Sit down for uh, meals with them. That was a big mistake, big mistake. Because, you know, like I was a cop reporter. The thing I know about cops is they don't tell you everything at the start. What is going to happen over the next few weeks and months, because this is going to go on for months, we are going to learn even more unsavory things about the people who were involved in this, some of them, not all of them. Like we saw in Coots, Alberta, you know, I'm from Calgary, you know, the, the, there was just this pro protest taking place at the Coots border crossing. And by the way, Jason Kenney, who now says he's going to oppose the Emergencies Act, had quietly just a few days before requested Justin Trudeau's help to deal with the emergency at Coots. 
But, you know, there's been a number of men who have now been arrested associated with a far right and extremist organization who had body armor and guns and ammo who were have been charged with conspiracy to murder. They were apparently going to allegedly going to go to the Coots border crossing to kill police officers. So this is the problem the conservative party has got. You know, they're supposed to be the party, Brian, as you know, of lower taxes, smaller government and law and order. Well, that third leg of the stool, they have blown that to bits for the time being. You know, what happened to their preoccupation with law and order? Like there, I've seen tweets from conservative MPs in the past few days criticizing the Ottawa police and the RCMP. Like seriously? Like I could see the NDP doing that. But is, you know, the body snatching <laughs> been so complete that you guys are now against the cops? I've never seen anything like it. I interviewed a... Um... Juno award-winning reggae artist last night who um, is getting a park named after him in uh, Brampton. Uh, he's, uh, he's such a community leader and, uh, and so influential in the uh, liberate uh, uh, black, uh, uh, black Lives Matter, et cetera, movement. And he said, Brian, it disgusted me what was going on because if those people were black or indigenous, the army would have come out, uh, the police would have been brutal, the, uh, the result would have been dramatically different. Yeah, well, my daughter is Indigenous, as you know, and she lives in Ottawa. And um, I had to pay for a lot of Ubers during the protest because she was getting attacked and vilified for wearing a mask and also being a person of color. But she said the same thing to me. She said, Dad, you know, if it was Indigenous people like me, this thing wouldn't have gone on for three and a half weeks. They would have wrapped it up in about three hours. So, um, yeah, there hasn't been an unequal uh, application of justice. And that, too, is one of the things these commissions of inquiry need to look at. You went on with a couple of other uh, findings that a third of Canadians now actually favor using violence to protect fundamental Canadian values. And an incredible number, 70 percent, wanted the truckers cleared out of Ottawa, if necessary, using violence or worse, as you mentioned. Um, what do you think of that? Is that would that have existed in the first week? Um, did it take the, the three weeks for people to get so mad? Like, how did we come to that? Well, it just, yeah, because it went on so long. Like, as you know, uh, and I know in Ottawa, I worked there for Mr. Kretzian, I was his special assistant. I worked in one of those buildings, right, you know, I think in where the, some of the porta potties were located. And, um, you know, it's our, it's our seat of government. It's the church of government there. And it's a special place. And people come from around the country to see it. And so it wasn't just people in Ottawa who were upset. You know, one of the things I learned when I was a chief of staff there, um, a minister said to me, I was worried about doing a renovation at Center Block once. It was falling apart, but I didn't want to spend the money because I thought the opposition would go after us. And that minister said to me something that I learned. He said, it's not our buildings. It's those buildings belong to the people. They belong to Canadians and we're going to make the repairs. And he was right to say that. And I was wrong to have the position I had. It's it belongs to the people. Ottawa. It's not just downtown Ottawa people. That's why I think the protesters lost the country, is people saw that and uh, got more and more mad at them. It's like, okay, guys, you've made your point. Go home. Go home. Stop doing this. And then the things that made it worse were, you know, the swastika flags, Confederate flags, defacing the statue of a boy who ran across the country on one leg to raise money for vaccine research, Terry Fox urinating on the war memorial, stealing food from a soup kitchen, like just absolutely deplorable behavior. And that's where they lost people because Ottawa doesn't just belong to Ottawans, it belongs to the country. I spoke to a couple of people involved in the protest and uh, or occupation, and they said that the Confederate flag, the Nazi swastika were plants by outside parties trying to discredit the protest. Prove it. Prove it. I mean, the thing, you know, is, you know, I've been writing about the far right for more than 30 years and I've interviewed all of these jerks and, you know, from the Aryan nations to the white Aryan resistance, all of them. And I've done sometimes done that at gunpoint myself. Um, and, um, you know, the thing, it did not surprise me when these guys showed up in Ottawa, when they heard that there were millions of dollars being raised, when they saw the amount of publicity that was being generated, when they saw the number of angry recruits that they could recruit, 
it was an inevitability that the far right would show up in Ottawa. That to me wasn't a surprise. That actually wasn't even news. What was news was when that jerk raised the, the swastika flag in front of East Block, right, on Parliament Hill, nobody stopped him. He was, there was another swastika flag hanging on a hotel, like on the balcony for days, just on the edge of downtown. Nobody stopped that. The Confederate flags, you know, the dancing on the war memorial, all this other stuff. You know, I had a number of these people writing to me, and perhaps you did too. Warren, why aren't you writing about the bouncy castles and how people are behaving themselves? And I'd write back and i say, because obeying the law is not news, guys. Having a bouncy castle is not news. That's how you are supposed to behave. That is how you are supposed to be. It's not newsworthy that you obey the law. What's newsworthy is that somebody raised a swastika flag at our church of government and none of you did anything to stop it. That's news. You know, I just happened to be watching The Sound of Music the weekend and, uh, and Captain Von Trapp comes back from his honeymoon and sees the flag, <laughs> the Nazi flag on his mansion and he comes up and he rips it. Um, even a... though the vast majority of his uh, of his uh, countrymen in Austria were welcoming the Nazis in, and uh, as you know, he had to escape. And and that simple act of defiance of ripping up the bloody thing, um, even though it was going to harm him, um, no one in the Conservative Party in the in the truck convoy in those protests was willing to to walk up to that flag and rip it, which which I found shocking. But actually, you know what it was not shocking, but but disappointing. Disappointing. Yeah. Was the number of American flags and Trump 2024 banners. Yeah, it's like, guys, you're in the wrong country. If you want to pedal that stuff, head south, point your truck south and go that way. Um, because, you know, Trump isn't running in Canada. And the Confederate flag, as my colleague Brian Lilly at Post Media said, like, go to Dixie. Like, it doesn't apply here. But I think what it is is representative of the thinking or the lack of thinking of some of the protesters, that they think they're involved in this kind of class struggle in the way that, you know, some of the people on January 6th on Capitol Hill acted. But, you know, the sad result, Brian, because uh, both of us have been in the parliament buildings many times. And I remember the good old days, you know, when I was a young liberal, you could just kind of walk in there and wave your ID and it was safe. You know, you could do that now, like the the truckers, the one change, concrete change that they have produced, it is going to be an armed encampment on, on Parliament Hill, like we see on Capitol Hill, you know, with bollards coming up from the roads and blockades and armed guards with, you know, assault rifles and so on. That is going to be the new reality on the Hill. And that's very sad because that wasn't the country we were just a few weeks ago. Obviously, the Ottawa police didn't take the same kind of uh, preparatory uh, action that Toronto, Quebec City, Montreal, etc. did uh, that stopped uh, the encampment from uh, from staying. But what if they had actually attacked Parliament? If if it had been like January 6th in the United States, what do you think would have happened? Uh, I think, I mean, the one good thing, the problem with Ottawa, I was the courts and cops reporter at the Ottawa Citizen during my, the bar admission course. And the thing I learned about Ottawa, and I had some sympathy for the former Ottawa police chief, is it is multi-jurisdictional in a way that's crazy. So, you know, look, basically there's a police force for inside the parliament buildings. Then there's a police force for from the parliament buildings to that fence, you know, that was filmed so often the weekend. Then there's another police force for the roads below that. And it's they're at the municipal, provincial and federal level. And there's a special protective detail for eminent persons like the prime minister or the leader of the opposition. I think we need to do what the Americans have done and create a capital police force. So we have an integrated command structure to avoid this situation in, in the future. And also, you know, they obviously, you don't need to be an expert in policing to know you need to do what Toronto, Regina, Quebec City and other jurisdictions did, which is prevent these guys from setting up shop in the first place. That was the mistake that Ottawa made. I think the big difference uh, versus other protests, because uh, you know I've been in protests probably like you have been um, and been proud to be part of some, um, was that it just wasn't people. It was trucks, SUVs, big trucks and rigs. And, and I think that 
you know, people have the right to protest, but I don't think you have the right to bring a big 18 wheel truck to a protest. Do you? No, uh, you do not. And you're sending a message. And we, as we've seen with Islamist extremists in Europe, trucks can be used by any vehicle, but trucks in particular can be used as a weapon to cause multiple casualties. That has happened many times in Europe and to some extent in the United States. So yeah, I think that was the one of the anxieties people like my daughter and other residents of Ottawa downtown had was these weren't just trucks honking their horns and spewing diesel fuels, you know, 24 hours a day. These were potential weapons in the wrong hands. And fortunately, thank God it didn't come to that. I'm chatting tonight with Warren Kinsella. He's the head of, uh, of a public affairs, government affairs uh, organization called Daisy Group. He's a columnist with uh, Post Media. Uh, and I'm asking him about, uh, number one, a column that he wrote on the weekend called uh, Protesters Change Canada, but not in the ways they expected or wanted. He quoted uh, a bunch of polls or one poll that came out on the weekend that found that the vast majority of Canadians were against what was going on in Ottawa. Uh, nearly 70% supported uh, the Emergencies uh, Act. 82% uh, said there's no way that the Ottawa occupation should have gone this long. 54% said they were ashamed of being Canadian or ashamed to be a Canadian because of the politicians who allowed the situation to get out of hand. And many more, 71% that said it was an international embarrassment. I do think that the international reputation of Canada has been harmed. And the amount of protesters that were on Fox News and the amount of conservative politicians that fed into that in Fox News, I think it's, 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 it's atrocious. It is. What was the number? Here's a quiz. Here's a question I asked my staff. The number one news organization in the world to pay the most attention to uh, the Ottawa protests. You know, obviously, Canadian media were the most. I think the National and CBC had its best numbers in years on Friday night. The organization internationally that paid the most attention, Brian, to what went on in Ottawa, Russia Today. So on the brink of war, with uh, in the Ukraine, and we are obviously supporting, you know, the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian government. Russia had a particular and understandable interest in showing that Canada was falling apart and it was anarchy and chaos. And as you point out, those on the right wing, the extreme right wing, were doing the same thing. Like a, a, a celebrity, a host on Fox News, reported on Friday night that a woman was trampled to death by horses on Parliament Hill. Uh, Rebel News reported that Trudeau ordered, quote unquote, those horses to trample people. Both were flat out lies. They were false. Now, to her credit, the woman on Fox News acknowledged her mistake and re retracted her, her tweeted report. I'm not sure if Rebel News did that. They should do that. But, you know, it wasn't just the New York Times, as we talked about before the break, on the right side of the spectrum, too, and I'm writing a column about this, there was just some shocking BS being peddled. And that doesn't serve democracy. That doesn't serve anybody. We're going to take a break um, with uh, Warren Kinsella. I'm going to come back and ask him what the political ramifications and implications are for this. What should Trudeau do? What should the Conservative Party do? Is there anyone that can bring the country together? Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Warren Kinsella, head of the Daisy Group, columnist with uh, uh, Post Media. Uh, and I'm asking him about an article that he wrote, a column that he wrote on uh, Sunday in the Toronto Sun. Protesters changed Canada, but not in the ways they expected or wanted. And he quoted a poll that showed that the vast majority of Canadians were supportive of the Emergency Measures Act and were against what was going on uh, in Ottawa, so much so that actually they would have uh, agreed, some of them, with violence or more um, in, uh, in getting the protesters out. Warren, I want you to take a step back, if you could now, and think about the implications for this. Uh, I did speak with John Wright. I interviewed him um, you know, a week ago before uh, the, uh, the, uh, the police moved in. Um, and, uh, and he said an interesting thing. He said that the vast majority of Canadians were, were supportive of vaccine mandates, were supportive of vaccine passports, were supportive of what uh, public health officials were doing across Canada. But he said 15% of Canadians aren't. And he said that's three and a half to four and a half million people. And you can't call them degenerates. You got to somehow 
reach out to three and a half to four and a half million people. Um, and by doing so, you're excluding them from Canadian society. He said, you can't exclude that many people from Canadian society. And, and we need someone that's going to bring Canada together. Trudeau, our prime minister, obviously didn't do that. And, and some people think he flamed the, uh, the flames. He, 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 uh, he, he added oxygen to what was going on because some of his words. What do you think the Liberal Party, the prime minister, need to do to try to quiet this down and to try to reach out to the, you know, not everyone's a, a, a white wing, uh, white supremacist fanatic. Some of these people are, you know, your neighbors and my neighbors that just don't believe in vaccines or don't want to be forced to take a vaccine. Yeah, I my answer to a Canadian question is an American example. You know, when I worked for Hillary and I was so privileged to work for, her, you know, former secretary of state, former first lady, former senator from New York State, and just an extraordinary person. And I couldn't believe, Brian, that she lost to this son of a bitch, you know, who is racist, who is sexist, who um, uh, had behaved terribly for for decades. How can we lose to that guy? And so I became kind of an odyssey for me, trying to understand, because that is your question, those people voted for him. You know, that demographic, and we saw this in Britain with Brexit, but the Trump vote. So if you look at the Rust Belt states and those places he won, that tipped him over in the Electoral College vote, for sure, they're white, older guys, maybe high school education, maybe community college. Yes, there's some racism there. Yes, there's some misogyny there. But the vast majority of them are people who feel that they are the forgotten. They feel they've been left behind by technological change. They've been left behind by cultural change, economic change, political change. You know, they used to be the ones in control, and they are no longer. You know, they see women, you know, in positions of prominence, in, in politics and business, they see people with a different skin color and different religions coming from other countries, and they feel stealing their jobs. So the question you ask is critically important. I know everybody's mad at those guys right now for what they did to Ottawa, but we need to calm down as a country and figure out ways to reach out to those people and make them feel that they are not forgotten and make them feel that they have a place in the future Canada. We, it, it is in, like, forget about being, you know, uh, well-intentioned or a good Christian or a good Jew or a good Muslim. Forget about any of that. It is in our personal self-interest to reach out to that constituency, because as you just pointed out, they're not tiny. They are growing. They're not the majority, but there is a group, there's a constituency out there who are angry and feel disaffected and alienated. We need to reach out to them and bring them in. Uh, Justin Trudeau, our prime minister, um, if you were advising him, what would you say that he has to do to, to try to? <laughs> well, I think he's the worst prime minister in my lifetime. I am no fan of that guy. Um, so I agreed with the, the truckers, I guess, in that way. Um, you know, he just did it all wrong, Brian. Like he, you know, at the outset, he called them names and made them matter. Just that's never a good negotiating strategy. Then he ignored them. He pretended like the issue wasn't happening. Then he went to the opposite extreme and brought in the emergencies act. I felt he should have done what his dad did. Uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember in 1967, um, and perhaps you are too. I think you're much younger than me. When his dad went to the Saint Jean Baptiste parade in Montreal, remember that? Yep. And um, the separatists were all there and they started throwing, you know, he was advised, Trudeau was advised, don't go to that parade. We cannot provide you with security. There's going to be a problem. And there was. And they started throwing rocks and bricks to the, um, you know, the people, the dignitaries were on stage. They all left except for one guy, Pierre Trudeau. That's when he became prime minister. I felt that Trudeau should have met with him. I know it probably would have been a shit show. They would have yelled at him. They might have thrown things at him too. But if he just maintained his calm and looked like a prime minister and at least made an effort to listen to them, then when he brought in the Emergencies Act, he can say, look, I tried. I tried. I met with these guys. I did my best. You saw that with your own eyes. Didn't work. We now have to take action. He didn't do that. You know, he went from one extreme to the other. And I think that's why a lot of people who are not 
extremists, as you point out, uh, are concerned about the emergency act. I think there's a lot of people that are worried about uh, the Conservative Party. And, um, and, you know, maybe they aren't what the current Conservative Party thinks are true Conservatives, but they're people that used to be red Tories or progressive Conservatives or, or just a little bit more centrist. Um, and they see what uh, Pierre Polyev uh, did uh, and has been doing, catering to the very extreme right wing of, uh, of, of the protesters and going out and meeting with them. Um, and uh, and then a lot of the comments he's made and, and the stances he's taken in the two weeks that he's right now the front runner in the in the Conservative Party leadership uh, race um, that are almost Trump like uh, in uh, in in their partisanship and uh, and uh, populism. What do you think is going to happen to the Conservative Party? Do you think Polyev is going to win? And if that happens, is that going to take the Conservative Party more to the right? And or What's the solution? Is there someone like Chade that could do a better job and bring them back to the center? Well, the center is where most of the votes are. I mean, that's why historically Liberal Party of Canada has been the most successful politi political machine in Western democracy, because it drives in the center of the road. And driving in the center road is better than driving in the ditch on the far right or the far left. And so, you know, just this morning, I've heard from two conservative MPs who obviously I can't disclose their names, who are very concerned of what's happening in their party. They feel if there is a rapid leadership race that obviously favors Polyev and hurts, you know, the Jean Charest, the Peter McKay's, those centrist conservatives who are successful politicians, right? Who know how to win elections. If they hand it over to Polyev, like they're just, you know, again, as I said a few minutes ago, preaching to the converted that angry Western populist gang. And I'm from the West, so I'm not maligning the West. Like, it, it's just a mistake. You need to broaden the base of the Conservative Party. That's what Trudeau did. Trudeau actually owns a lot of New Democrat vote as well. And I suspect he owns even more vote after bringing in the Emergencies Act. So yeah, Polyev, I think, would be a big, big mistake. Uh, but it looks like that's what they're going to do. If I was... Uh you know, a senior person within the Conservative Party right now, I'd be looking for a female bilingual centrist to lead the party. Is there yep. one? Yeah, I totally <laughs> agree. But I mean, all of the ones, you know, the Lisa Rates, the Rona Ambrose, the Michelle um, uh, Garner, uh, Rempel Garner, um, you know, all of those examples, they always absent themselves from it. Part of it, I think, is because of the way in which uh, women are treated um, in politics these days, they get knocked around much more than men do. And, um, you know, a lot of them have said to hell with this. Um, the, I agree with you 100%. And not like a, you know, kind of a stunt like Kim Campbell was. That was a bit of a Hail Mary pass. You know, somebody who's got some experience, all three of those women have been um, cabinet ministers and have got to uh, have got the wherewithal to to win and know the country. But it looks like the Conservative Party is just going to keep making the same mistake over and over again. And we all know what that's the definition of. Uh, you've got a, a premier in Saskatchewan, a premier in Manitoba, a premier in Alberta that that seem to have caved to uh, the, the protesters. What do you think the implications for them are? Are they going to be seen positively because they're all from the West and, and this is their base? Or are there, is there going to be a reaction against them? Well, I think Kenny's one and done. I think he just, uh, he throws everything at the wall to see what sticks. And um, Scott Moe, um, let's put it this way, he's no Brad Wall. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, for me, the lifting of the restrictions, my dad was an immunologist. And, you know, my brothers and I grew up in a household where we heard about how viruses are smarter than politicians. And viruses have a way, you know, as AIDS did and, and many other viruses of surprising people. This virus is uh, very adaptive. It is very flexible. And it has made every politician on the planet look like a horse's ass. Whenever they predict something, Brian, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to write a column about this. Whenever they predict something about the change and it's a bright new day, you know, Jason Kenney had hats made saying, you know, last summer saying best Alberta summer ever. Well, they didn't sell too many of the hats because, you know, infections exploded. I do not think the virus is done with us. 
And I think politicians who live rush to lift restrictions, they're going to be they're going to pay a price politically. So if you were uh, prime minister today, say it's not Justin Trudeau, someone else or yourself, what would you do? Would you keep restrictions in place? Would you keep mandates in place? Would you? I would, um, my focus would be on, like, like, let's look at what happened with Omicron. Maybe this is a good way to end. You know, Omicron um, came to us, it looks like, from Africa. And Laurie Garrett is a, a writer. She's won a Pulitzer. And uh, she wrote a book about 25 years ago that called The Great Plague that predicted everything, Brian, that has happened. Everything, with the exception of Trump and the name of this thing. And, you know, I was watching her interviewed on CNN. She's so smart. And she's, you know, Anderson Cooper said to her, well, when do you think this is going to end? She said, well, three years, it's going to last minimum. And he was deflated by that. And she said, Anderson, like, we're going to, we're doing what we always do. The first world's taking care of itself. We're immunizing ourselves and boosting ourselves. So what does the virus do? It orbits out to Africa, mutates and comes back until we have a, so my answer to your question, and I apologize, is a long answer. If I were prime minister or president or king of the world, I would be developing a strategy that is truly global because we are not going to be rid of this thing if we're just dealing with North America and Western Europe. We need to have a global strategy to deal with COVID. Otherwise, it's just going to keep bouncing around and keep infecting people and keep killing people. Warren Kinsella, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the column that you wrote. It got a lot of, uh, a lot of repeats and likes and shares on my Twitter feed and, uh, and, and other social media. Obviously, it resonated with a lot of people. Uh, if you get a chance, everyone, reach out to, uh, to the Toronto Sun or Post Media Sunday. Kinsella, protesters changed Canada, but not in the ways they expected or wanted. Warren Kinsella, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, my friend. I've got somebody at my front door. I'm just going to bolt. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.